I, I'm going to try and compress time here and get from before the nick to the present uh, in about 15 minutes. Um, once upon a time, a band from Liverpool called The Beatles were bursting onto the world scene and they released their first album, Please Please Me. The song, There's a Place, on that album was written in Paul McCartney's house in 20 Fortland Road, Allerton, Liverpool. And the first verse goes, there's a place where I can go when I feel low, when I feel blue, and it's my mind, and there's no time when I'm alone. It was inspired by the song Somewhere from the musical West Side Story, which contained the line, there's a place for us. Somewhere else in Liverpool, just a 20 minute drive from Paul McCartney's house that same year, another Paul burst onto the world scene. His arrival eclipsed, some would say, unfairly by the Beatles. <laughs> the somewhere I chose as my first home was a place called Rain Hill Hospital. And like all the old asylums, its name changed down through the years in an apparent attempt to outrun stigma. When first built in 1851, it was called Lancashire County Asylum. Then the County Lunatic Asylum, Rain Hill. Then the County Mental Hospital, Rain Hill. Then Rain Hill Mental Hospital. And finally, Rain Hill Hospital until its closure in 1991, the year I embarked on my own career in psychiatry. I chose this place to live in order to allow my father complete his training in psychiatry and prepare for his first consultant post. In 1936, it housed 3,000 inpatients, or inmates, as was the terminology of the time, and it was said to be Europe's largest mental hospital. My memories of here are necessarily vicarious, however, because at the age of one, I became concerned I might develop the same accent as my Beatle neighbours, <laughs> and so I arranged to leave. Developments were happening very fast around that time. <clears throat> Insulin coma therapy used throughout the US and the UK for the treatment of schizophrenia in the 40s and 50s was dying out. In the 20 years after 1954, over 30 antipsychotic medications were introduced worldwide. And so it was bye-bye to insulin coma therapy, thanks to research, and hello to medications that proved helpful in the treatment of psychosis. My father was not sorry to see insulin coma therapy go. The 1950s also saw the introduction of antidepressants, but they were slower to develop. The 1960s were a time of liberation generally, and this was true for mental hospitals too. I mentioned vicarious memories there a while ago, and one such concerns a Catholic priest, pun intended, uh, an uncle of mine who was visiting us while we were staying in a flat in Rainhill Hospital on the second floor. And in the middle of the night, he had to use the bathroom, and having done so, he was unable to open the door to get back out. He's a very considerate man, and he didn't want, and he worried about who and how many people he might disturb if he was to cry out for help in the middle of the night in the center of the mental hospital. And so he climbed out the bathroom window onto a ledge and sidled along until he could get back in another window. To a bemused onlooker, he must have looked like an inmate who started to escape and either became befuddled or got cold feet. With the advent of treatments that were effective for psychiatric disorders, it meant the asylums were no longer merely places of custody, but also places of therapy. And this, together with significant social and political shift, meant it was possible to reverse the trend towards ever-increasing inpatient populations and start to treat people living at home. And these were really exciting times in psychiatry terms of momentous change. And my father, enthused by it all, set his sights on returning to Ireland and continuing this trend in his homeland. 
And so he bundled us all into his Morris Minor and drove us to the airport and into the basking shark's mouth of the plane because he could do that back then for a little while. And he flew us and the car over here to Dublin. Here he took up his first post as consultant as governor of the Central Mental Hospital, Ireland's Broadmoor. <clears throat> it's a mental health facility for those of you who don't know about it. It's a mental health facility that houses forensic patients. In fact, it predates um, Broadmoor by 13 years, being built in 1850. And it was first called the Central Criminal Lunatic Asylum for Ireland. And it was, in fact, Europe's first so-called secure hospital. It now also housed me and my family because consultants back then were expected to live in the hospital grounds. And so at first we lived in a flat in the hospital and my youngest brother sent me a photograph uh, a few years ago of the on-call room where he was working. It had been my bedroom when I was two years of age and it hadn't changed much since then. We then moved into a house in the hospital grounds. And it's from here that my first true memories arise. Here I am with two of my brothers in the hospital grounds for the criminally insane. <laughs> I remember Martin playing hide and seek with us and the shrieks of delighted laughter as we ran to hide and he counted down to pursuit. He would often mind us when my mother was out shopping and my father was at work. Years earlier, the details of which were never really spoken about, he had killed someone. A sombre, loyal and affectionate man who had never experienced a stable childhood of his own. He confided in my mother one day in the kitchen over a cup of tea that I did something very bad once when I was not myself. He was very trusted now and indeed loved by us. And it was he who came to warn us when another patient had escaped in the hospital grounds and was being searched for so that we were to be brought indoors. The walls, or the grounds were and are surrounded by high walls. <clears throat> another memory, clear memory, is of visiting the walled garden and of Jim a forensic patient also working there, and of him raising a rake above his head to gently pull down a branch laden with ripe plums so that I could pick them myself with my then tiny hands. I might just change a picture. This is him and me laughing in the hospital grounds. <clears throat> I've always loved wall garden since. And there was always a well-tended wall garden in each of the psychiatric hospitals I lived in. At the age of four, I became concerned I might develop a Dublin accent. <laughs> and my parents were concerned about the effects of bringing us up in such a rarefied institution. And so in true pioneer spirit, we moved west. And again, at first, we lived in a flat in St. Mary's Hospital in Castlebar, County Mayo, before moving into a house in the hospital grounds. And it's here that we felt we had true freedom. This hospital and subsequently St. Patrick's Hospital in Castlereagh, County Roscommon, and then in St. Bridget's Hospital, Ballinasloe, County Galway, all had extensive farms, farmyards, their own baker, their own cobbler, their own industrial therapy, their own occupational therapy, their huge laundries and huge boilers, boiler houses, and all were part of our childhood as we freely wandered the wards and frequently danced with the patients. We never felt, never felt afraid or threatened in these places. They were <clears throat> truly our playground. Indeed, each of them would have a large hall <clears throat> with a, a stage at one end and a piano beside it where we would indulge our imaginations on rainy days. And yes, I know the fact, I don't know if I mentioned that I am the son of a psychiatrist and I'm also the brother of two psychiatrists. So 
it may seem that we lacked imagination, but back then, <laughs> back then we were pirates and cowboys and Indians and Tarzan and Frankenstein and the Beatles. Contrary to the perception of the general public, we had great freedom and we knew we were very privileged to be living in the same places that all the other kids in the community were being warned about, being careful they didn't end up in. And none of us would have changed our upbringing. All but one of these huge institutions that were home to thousands of suffering people have now closed. The Central Mental Hospital here in Dublin still functions, but is due an historic move of premises soon. St. Mary's Hospital in Castle Bar is now a third level education institute, although the house on the grounds where we lived is a community mental health team base. St. Patrick's Hospital in Castle Ree is now surrounded by high walls that weren't there when I was there because it has become a prison. And the house we lived in, I'm told, now houses IRA prisoners. And it was here I first learned the joys of doing my own gardening and grew my first delicious tomatoes aged 12. St. Bridges Hospital in Banalasloe had 1,600 inpatients, 1,600 inpatients, when we moved there first in 1976. It was a huge employer in the area with grandparents and parents and their children all working there at the same time. It's now largely derelict. I'm well aware of the stories of horror associated with these institutions, but it was not all bad. Undeniably, they did have to close as their function became both corrupted and obsolete. But there were good people working within them for noble causes and with a strong sense of duty to and care for their fellow man. The treatment of people with mental illness has now moved on to the point where the vast majority are treated at home. And those that do require inpatient treatment can expect to be in hospital, for, generally speaking, for short periods. However, there are those people who find living in the community very difficult and more isolating and lonely than in the institutions whose doors have closed. They do not require a reopening of the vast, regimented and outdated institutions. But they do know their needs are not being catered for. And like me, after their time in hospital, and with the sound of the doors slamming shut behind them still ringing <coughs> in their ears, they stand blinking in the bright lights of the community and wonder, what now? And so I finish by, with my son Carl here, over here, over here. <laughs> <laughs> by turning back to my former neighbor, John Lennon, who in 1965, noticing I had left for Dublin, wrote a plea that remains relevant. And I trust someday we'll know how best to help. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone and I'm not so self-assured. And now I find I change my mind and open up the door Help me if you can, I'm feeling down And I do appreciate you being round Help me get my feet back on the ground Won't you please, please help me And 
Now my life is changing in oh so many ways My independence seems to vanish in the haze And every now and then I feel so insecure I know that I just need you like I've never done before Help me if you can, I'm feeling down And I do appreciate you being around Help me get my feet back on the ground Won't you please, please help me And how I need somebody help Not just anybody help you know I need someone Help Help I need somebody help Not just anybody help You know I need someone